Okay, well, uh, first, thank you for the invitation. It's really great to be here for your first time in Big Rue. So, um, maybe to begin, a, a little word of introduction about me, because uh, you will see that. Okay, so I, I, am a, I am an applied mathematician coming from the Kurt Institute of Mathematical Science. I don't work on glasses. <laughs> so, but that's why the introduction was maybe necessary. So you, you could ask, why am I here? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> ask myself before coming. In fact, I'm here because I, I, was, I was asked by Julio um, to give classes in stochastic process theory, probability, large deviation, these type of things. Because this is what I do. <coughs> so I, I don't do that really as a probabilist. I do that as an applied mathematician. So I try to develop tools that either are synthetic tools or computational tools that are based on modern approach of uh, <coughs> probability applied to statistical mechanics, like large deviation theory that we're going to be discussing quite a lot. Now, what I'm going to do during the classes uh, may not have or may not seem like it will have direct relation with the problem that the other lecture um, We'll be discussing, but, but I, I think actually that's not completely true in the sense that eventually you will find that there are collections. Uh, in the sense that wh what I'll try to do is to give you some tools <coughs> that, at some point for sure, will be useful to you if you if you do statistical mechanics of complex systems. Okay. Now, um, one of the aspects of this is that. I'll probably present material that you already know in some form, but I'll show it to you or present it to you in a different way. And that means I'm going to maybe try to take a viewpoint which is more from mathematics rather than physics. Okay? I think that's useful too because quite often in your research, you will, quite often or sometimes, let's say, you will have to go and open books of mathematics to try to find you know, a result in there that might be useful. And that exercise can be quite frustrating because the jargon is quite different. And typically, the emphasis is also quite different. Mathematician tends to insist quite a lot on rigorous proof. And in this rigorous proof, there are often many steps that are not so important or relevant for physicists or even applied mathematician. But then there are quite a few that are essential. And you still sort of need to train yourself into kind of, you know, finding what is key and eliminating all the rest. Okay? And that's a transition that, in fact, I had to do too because I was trained as a, as a theoretical physicist and then I moved into a mathematics department. So to be able to talk with my colleagues, I had to somehow, you know, do that. Okay. So with all these preambles, what I'm going to be discussing, we're going to start maybe a little bit slow, like, and, and then we're going to build up into things that are more sophisticated. But what I'm going to be discussing uh, today is essentially the trinity of probability. And I'm going to talk about the third one, which is law of large number, the CLT, <coughs> and the large deviation principle. And, and I'll focus on this one for most of the class, okay? because that's the one that probably is the most important for what we're going to you know, we're going to do in the rest of the class. OK, so you, you know these things already. Uh, so if you have a sequence of random variables, so let's take that like that, xi, where i, say, belongs to n, and they are all identically distributed and independent, and independent identically distributed. OK, think about exponential random variable, Bernoulli random variable. I'll give you an example later. And then you consider the, uh, and they take value for the moment. Imagine that they take value in R. They could be continuous or discrete random variable, but let's just imagine that they go in R. Later on, we're going to discuss random variable that are much more complicated than that, which takes value either in RD or in space of sequences or in space of functions. And that's where the whole apparatus starts to become Interesting, but it's useful to start with this. It's actually quite hot when the, yeah, the, the door are closed. Oh, maybe that's because I'm just nervous. Um, OK, so what these guys say, well, they say the following. Suppose that you take uh, 
try to, because I realize that there's not an enormous amount of space on this board, so I'm going to save space as much as I can. So if you consider the partial sum, which is to take the sum from i equal 1 up to n of xi, and you make some assumption about the xi besides the fact that they're independent, particular <coughs> one, if you assume that the mean is finite, so that if you take the expectation of xi, it's equal to mu, and that can be well defined, then the law of large numbers says that if you take Sn and you scale it by n, as n goes to infinity, it converges to mu. And there are various versions of the law of large number. There is one that is the strong law of large number that tells you that this is happening almost surely. And there are weaker versions, for example, that this happens in distribution. That if you look at this, the distribution of this random variable, it converges to the distribution of this random variable, which is trivial because it's not random. Okay. So that's the law of large number. Now, there's another one that says that if, in addition, the second moment is finite, so let's call that you know, less than infinity, and you define sigma square as being the variance of xi, which is, is the expectation of the square m minus that, then you can scale things like, okay, so this guy tells you that the sum of these random variables, if you scale it by n, goes to mu. So what I can do is I could you know, take that guy, subtract n mu. That one, if I were to divide by n, goes to 0 by the first statement. So you could ask yourself, well, is there a way by which I can make a scaling of this random variable such that it, I get a limit that is non-trivial? Clearly, I need to blow it up because divide by n goes to 0, so I need to blow it up by something. This something, it turns out, is the square root of n. So you can write that like that. Or you can eliminate the square root of n here and put it over there. It's exactly the same thing. And then the CLT tells you that, you know, in distribution, this converges towards a Gaussian random variable, or normal, which means 0 and variant sigma square. OK? And this converges is in distribution. Right? So if you wish, what's happening is that if you make a little graph that I'll do here, if you have, you know, if this is the mu here, and you look at the distribution of s n over n, it will concentrate here, right? And it will become, essentially, locally, it will look like a little, if I were to look at the distribution, it will look like a little Gaussian over here, with a variance <coughs> that's like, so I'm going to do the square root of the variance, that's like sigma over square root of n, which shrinks. Right? So these statements tell you what the limit is and what is the rate of convergence, in a way. Okay? Now, what, so that's this part. And the proof of this statement is actually quite elementary. We can discuss that offline if you want. There's many ways you can prove them, and the proofs are known since Gauss and you know, even before that. <coughs> now, what that we would, I would like to discuss a little bit more is the problem of large deviation, which is what happens if you ask what's going on here, for example, or, or on the other side. Meaning, if you go all one away from the mean. Okay. If you go all one away from the mean, you cannot, in general, extrapolate what this statement tells you. Because the way you derive the CLT is actually not by looking at things on this scale. On this scale, you get the law of large number. To get the CLT, you need to recenter things at mu. And you need to stretch things like this. So what happened in the tail is gone when you take that limit there. Okay? For example, it explains something which is, you know, could, you could find strange, which is that this statement is true even if you take random variables whose second moment is finite, but third isn't. Right? That 
first side is a little bit strange because this guy, of course, has all moments that are finite. It actually decays very, very fast. It's a Gaussian. So you may ask, well, how come that, you know, if I have something here that has mass in the tail, I don't see it there? Well, that's because it's going the limit. But of course, if I want to look at large deviation, then this will come back at me. Yes? I'm curious. <coughs> Why is the uh, mean zero, the end, the average? Because I subtracted the mean. OK, so what, what, what we're going to do next is to try to calculate the following thing, which is we're going to take p of Sn. We're going to ask what is the probability that this is bigger or equal to n times a if you take a bigger than mu. That's putting <coughs> an a here. You could also take Sn less than n a with a less than mu. So in order to understand what's going on here, we can do a little game of guessing, which in fact is a little bit the same as the one that you could have done here, but slightly different, and which already will make a connection, you will see, with the statistical mechanics. So here, you could have guessed this result in the following way, namely that these two low the deterministic law, which is the trivial one, and the Gaussian are the only two laws that are stable. I'll explain a minute what that is. Stable under addition. If you look at random variables that have the first two moments finite, what does that mean? That means that if I take two random variables that are either in this class, the, the deterministic, or they are Gaussian. In the case of deterministic, of course, what I'm saying is trivial. But in the case of Gaussian, it isn't. So if you take two random variables in this class, if you sum them, you can rescale them. So you can multiply the sum by A and, and subtract the B in such a way that the sum has the same law as the two individuals. It's clear that if these partial sums have limits, they need to be in stable rows. Because you can always split the sum into two. They are all independent. And so the two partial sum needs to have a limit. And the limit of the partial sum must be such that if you sum them, you get the limit of the sum. So that's just why that needs to be stable. Okay. So now you can ask, let's do a similar little exercise with this to try to guess what we should have here. So this guy is a sum of random variable. And I'm asking, what's the probability that this sum will do something which is quite unlikely. I already know that this probability will go to 0 because, because the only thing that goes to 1 is this one. Right? I'm out of the scale of the CLP and the law of large numbers. So this could happen in several ways. You could imagine that, well, this is very, very big because one among all of the members of the sum does all the job. It's like. They are all doing what they should do. They are, you know, that like pretty much all the terms are wrong, right? They, they, they are consistent with the CLT of the, the law of large number, but there's one guy that explodes, right? This could happen, but it will not happen with the condition that I'm going to give now, which is that from now on, I'm going to assume not only that the first two moments exist, but that all moments exist. And we'll see, I'll give a condition in a minute about that. If all moments exist, that constraint is too strong for the scenario that I just explained to occur. So what happens typically is that they all do a little bit of the job. <coughs> okay? They share, they, all of these guys share you know, the, the work of putting themselves together above it. It's a very democratic type of uh, way the rare events occur. Okay. So if this is happening, what you know is that somehow, if I were to look at this with n replaced by 2n, I should get that the probability is the square of that one. So much smaller. Right? This guy will go to 0. Right? This guy will go, this probability will go to 0. And so what I should get is that if I look at the same probability but I replace n by 2n, I should roughly get the square of the probability at n because they're doing the job independently. And you know, for one half of the sum, it's going to go that. The other half is that, and the product will be OK. 
So this suggests that what we should get is, is something which goes to zero, and I'm going to be a, going to be a little symbol like that that will appear quite often. It should go to zero. The only function that does that is essentially the exponential. So this suggests that I should get something which is like that, and it's going to be an i of a here, where this function depends on the a that I've picked. And there is a factor n here. So I, I'm expecting that the probability will go to zero um, exponentially fast in n, right? By the argument that I just said. The question is, well, can, I, can we prove that and find what i is? So there is one, once you understand that, I mean, you, there's already one thing that you can do, is that you, you can quite easily find an upper bound for this, which is using Chebyshev, which is this guy, is the same as, uh, okay, let me, so I can write this, and this is true, for any lambda that's positive. This is just saying that uh, the, the probability of Sn being bigger than that is the same as Sn minus Na bigger than 0. Then you take the exponential with lambda that preserves the order. And, and then you use Markov inequality on this. OK? Uh, now, in order for this to make sense, I need to make an assumption. And so that's the assumption I'm going to make. Let me erase that little guy here. We're going to make one assumption, namely that if you take for <coughs> there, OK, so we're going to make the assumption that if you take, you compute this quantity, which is the, <coughs> it exists. For the moment, we could say for all lambda. Later on, we're going to show we would like this quantity to be finite, so less than infinity, for all lambda in R. But later on, we, we don't need something which is as strong as that. It could only be non-zero for lambda, which is close enough to zero. And that would be OK. But it's clearly, right, it's clearly finite if lambda is equal to zero. But like to be able to extend it a little bit away from zero. It's finite if lambda is equal to zero, because then it's the expectation of 1. right? And there's another quantity that will be very important, which is the log of this. So in physics, well, in, in math and physics, this is called the moment generating function. Because uh, if you tailor series expand this, and you, see if you tailor series expand this, and it's valid, it's, this is finite for every lambda in R, you can essentially interchange exp expectation and, and summation in the series. And in fact, what you get is that this is a series of all the moments. And that one is the cumulant generating function. <coughs> when you take the moment generator, you take the log, you get the cumulant generating function. That will come into play in the lectures that you will have quite often. OK, so if you look at this, and you have the bound that's there, right? you see that I can rewrite, OK, so no, you, you use, uh, the, so for this guy here is, does, is not random, so I can take it out of the, ex, the expectation. This one here is an expectation of a sum. So it's the, ex, okay, it's the, expect, it's the expectation of the exponential of a sum. Uh, okay, the exponential of a sum is the product of the exponential. And the expectation of the product is the product of the expectation because I have assumed that they're independent. And so each of them, what you see here, you get an m of lambda. And so if you do the calculation, what you end up having is that this is simply what you will obtain is this guy. I put the n. Uh, the n come from the fact that there were n terms here, so that's the you know this is to the n, and that n come because I put it to begin with. Yes. Uh, we except that uh, I I did that the wrong way because the, the, the inequality was like this right. for lambda positive. Okay. So now, what you have obtained here is a bound, 
right? That is valid for any lambda. So you can optimize the bound, which is that you can try, so this is an upper bound, so I can try to make this guy as small as I want, right? So I could insert here a soup over lambda. Strictly speaking, it's a soup over lambda positive, but in a minute I'll show you that uh, you don't need a bigger than zero, we can eliminate it. So I have a candidate for the i of a here through this bound, which is that the candidate is to say that i of a is simply the soup, no, sorry, I, 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 am, uh, I, I am making a mess because it's, it's, I, I, uh, it's this guy that I need to have, right? So at the moment, this one that we're gonna eliminate, and so sorry, I'm gonna change the sign again, I was wrong the first time, and it's like, you know, it's like this, but I, I want to write it like that with a minus there and a plus there so that I can take the soup. Because the reason why I want to do that is because this guy is the Legendre transform of the lambda that is there, this function lambda. Okay? Now, there's a few things that you can check right away. And so, so this is what we have obtained here is a lower bound. It's an upper bound. Right? I, I have bounded from above. So if I can find a matching lower bound, I'm done. I would have shown that, in fact, the decay of this guy is of that type. And I still need to explain what this uh, thing is for the moment. This is what, you, what we have obtained. OK, so now I think about that for a little bit more. And, and let's try to look a little bit about what, what this quantity here is. Right? So first of all, um, you can <laughs> convince, so there's, no, there's a few steps that needs to be done, and they are all useful, uh, will be useful later on when we do things that are more complicated than this, which is first, I, I want to convince you about the fact that this function is convex. Okay. And the reason, so we're going we're, we're gonna to not only assume, no, we're going to assume something which is a little bit even more than what I had said before, we're going to assume that this quantity not only can be defined for every lambda, but you can also differentiate it. Okay, so where it's, I mean, later on we're going to generalize that, but that you can take as any derivative as you want of this quantity. It's infinity. So then you can convince yourself uh, of the following thing, and this is what uh, I'm going to introduce another object now, which is called the tilted distribution that will be tilted distribution or tilted measure, which, which goes like this. So imagine that the original random variable, the x is here, have, have, have a distribution p. I can construct a new distribution by doing the following operation. And maybe these, I'm going to explain this. Uh, which you can also write like this. That's essentially it. So what I'm using here as a dp and I, is, is simply, this is a distribution <coughs> that I use for this guy. The, the reason why I'm using a fancy notation like that is because I'd like to be able to consider at once cases where this is a continuous random variable or a discrete random variable. If it's a continuous random variable, then this dp just have a density times dx. Okay, it's like you can write that. And if it's discrete, it's a sum of Dirac. And if it's anything in between, well, it's a combination of the two. Okay. This guy, right, is the one which is such that if you want to take the expectation of any function of x or xi, that's the one that says you do it like this. So it's the one, you know, that you use to write the expectation in the following way, OK? Now, you can see that this object is also a distribution. Uh, why? Because 
it's positive, since this is positive, everything here is positive, right? And it's normalizable, because if I integrate this guy, you see that, well, this is a constant, and when I integrate this over x, I get that, that constant, so I get 1. <coughs> so it's normalized, OK? Why is this guy important? Well, this guy is important because we will see. The first, it will allow us to show that this quantity here is convex. And second, it will give us a little trick to actually compute large deviation by using the CLT and the law of large number, but at the level of the tilted random variable. OK, so let me go in steps and explain that. First of all, notice that if I calculate, so let me write the following thing. Uh, let's write E lambda of x. This is the expectation of, I, I could write it in different ways if you want, but this is the expectation of x with respect to the measure dp, lambda. Is the, the one where you take, this is not the original x, so probably I should put a little bit here to distinguish it, is the one that distributes with respect to that. Right? So that guy, by definition, is the integral of x dp lambda. So it's x e to the lambda x dp x divided by m lambda. You can convince yourself easily that this is m prime of lambda divided by m lambda, which is the same as lambda prime of lambda. So the derivative, and this we will use that in a minute, the derivative of this guy here is the mean of this tilted distribution. Okay. So you, you can do the, the same thing, which is that if you calculate the variance in this tilted ensemble of x, meaning if you calculate e lambda x tilde squared minus e lambda x tilde squared, you can Convince yourself just doing the calculation, that's why it's called the, 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 the cumulative generating function, in fact, that this is just two derivatives of lambda. So, since the variance is always positive, this shows that this quantity, of, or non negative, is slightly bigger than zero. And what this means, in fact, is simply that. Uh, this function that you have computed this way is always convex. Okay? So once you have understood that, you can try to, you now let's go back a minute about this, and to try to understand what this problem is about. This is called the Legendre Fanchel transform. Uh, the Fanchel is not necessary in, in this context, but okay, so. And it has a simple geometric interpretation which is, um, okay, so let me make a graph here that I will have to erase because otherwise I'm not going to have enough space. But if you look, so if you plot as a function of lambda, this function lambda, it's convex. And it needs to be such that uh, at zero, its slope needs to be the mean of the original random variable. That's because if I take lambda equals 0 in this expression, dp lambda is just dp. Right? So I can, I can try to draw a function which is convex and does that, like for example, something like this. Right? And if you look at the slope here, this guy, this guy here is mu. Right? Because the derivative of this at any lambda gives the mean of the tilted distribution, and at zero, it gives the mean of the original distribution. Right? Now, there's another line that is important here, which is the one that is lambda times a. If a is bigger than mu, remember there was a little graph here, I'm looking away from the mean, at the right of the mean. So if a is bigger than mu, that means that this line is like this. That's the line that has slope A, bigger than mu. Right? That's just the line A lambda. Okay? The soup here, 
Just pick the point where there is the maximal distance, which is this guy here. And it's always only a unique solution. And this quantity here right, is I of A. The one that they have defined by doing this. OK. Now, if everything is differentiable, there is another thing that you can do here, which is that you can just use standard rules of calculus. And you can say the following thing. Uh, you, can, you can try to solve this. Well, in fact, I write soup here, but in fact, it's just a max. Right? I'm just, I just need to find the point where this is being maximum. Right? And you see the argument that I made there, by the way, is telling you that from now on, I can actually delete this. Because the convexity of the function and the fact that A is bigger than mu tells you that the maximum here is always attained on this side. Because that's the maximizer. That's the lambda star in this guy. Right? For a given value of A. Right? But it also tells you that I of A, in fact, is 0 if A is equal to mu, which, which you should already know because somehow if, if, if A is equal to mu, this probability should be consistent with the law of large numbers, and so you should get something here that cannot decrease exponentially. The only way for that to not happen is if I of A is equal to 0 at that point. So I of mu is equal to 0. We have already obtained that. Now, let's write the equation for lambda star. Well, the equation for lambda star, let me write it down here. I can go all the way to this line, right? So if I, so it's just you take the derivative of this with respect to lambda. And you see that what you have is that A is equal to, that's the equation that you have. So I'm going to write it from the one like this. This function depends on A. This is the Euler Lagrange equation for this maximization. OK? And that gives you the lambda star of A. OK? That's the guy. So, the, if, so the, the, there's, you, you pick an A, then there's this guy that depends on A. And once you have found it, there is this quantity here, which is then simply uh, lambda star A A minus, okay, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's this quantity. That's the, way, that's the guy that you have obtained now by doing the maximization at this day. OK, so why, why is this? You know, wh why is this useful? Well, it's useful because you can use a trick that, in fact, is that one is really important, not only you know, for, for if you do theory, but if you do numerics. Namely, that in, in probability, unless you have non-random random variable, typically there is always, if there is a bit of randomness somewhere, you're never completely right or completely wrong. You can always change things a little bit and then re-weight. OK? And so, in particular, I can try instead, you know, any expectation that I write with respect to p lambda, as you can see here, is just a reweighting of an expectation with respect to p. Conversely, any expectation with respect to p is an expectation with respect to p lambda. I just need to put these factors on the other side. Right? Why is that useful? Well, it's useful because if I compute this probability here, right? Instead of computing it by, so the, if I were to try to do this, to calculate this probability like naively, this is just calculating a, new, a complicated integral, right? This is the integral over the set where the sum of these guys, right, is bigger than n a, and it's an integral over what? It's an integral over the product of all these uh, distribution. This one actually, the p. But I can do the same thing by saying, well. Let's not do it with respect to p, but let's take the expectation with respect to p lambda. But then let's put the factor that I need to make sure that this remains exact. Okay. So I'll write one equation, and I'll erase it, and I'll write the other one. Well, clearly, right? If I were to, I mean, this is what this is already what's written here. Okay. If I want to write, but I'll write it in a different way, then I'll erase. Suppose I want to take the expectation of any function f of x, that's I'm, what I'm writing here is a bit of a triviality, but I think it's useful. This is this. 
but this is this and then I can simply here put dp lambda x but if I, no, I, there's a proportionality factor that I need to add namely I need to put my m here which and then the e to the minus lambda x right so this says that well this is e lambda of f of x tilde e to the minus lambda x tilde times m of lambda so I can go from an expectation in x which is on the original distribution into an expectation over the tilted distribution which is here okay but you can do that I mean you can now try to do the same thing and I'll just write down the result uh, by asking yourself well what about an expectation of SN? Okay. Well, it's what you need to just do is you need to think what well, SN is the sum of x. So the probability that you have for the SN is just the product of all the p's for the member of the sum. For each of them, I can do this, and I can read off what happened. Okay. So if you do that, and if I, if I need that graph, I'll, yeah. Why do you need to put the tilde on the x? Just the because, I mean, th this is like a bit of a notation. Like, I, I mean, I, in principle, it's enough to write that. It's a bit redundant. The tilde just means this guy. I, I just, tr I don't want to, I, I, I'm trying to avoid confusion. The tilde here, the x tilde, is the random variable that is distributed according to this guy. Okay? So the notation that I use is that this you know, these are the variable x tilde, and dp, these were the variable x. It's a bit redundant because I also put, the, you know, the lambda in the expectation, and so it's just to make sure that there, there is no confusion. It seems that that had the opposite effect. But, so now if I look at that, let me, I'm, I'm going to erase that guy, um, except that I'm going to write the equation which was there. Can I write as low as this? So these are the two key equations, right? So if I erase that and I write the equivalent of this formula for the probability that's there, Eric? yeah. So, sorry, just I mean, just in this point, but the, uh, so the first of the two key equations a equal to lambda prime. Lambda prime, yes. Yes, you you took the right. <laughs> it's the derivative of this guy with respect to lambda, right? This is that, that's a, thank you. But that one is is with all the prime. So if you write this guy. It says this. It says that the probability. Okay, so the probability that S n is bigger or equal to n a, right? So this quantity, I can, in principle, this is an integral over a set. So this is an expectation of a set, which is the set where the, you know it's an integral where the sum of the x's is bigger. But but there is a way to write it in the following way, which is to say that. This is, that's an identity. I'm just reading the equivalent of this. If I do that with the product measure, because I'm not using one x, I'm using the sum of the x's. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a product of these guys here. So I'll write, in fact, I'll write it in the following way here. I'll write that. I'm going to get a product of n of these guys. But the product of n of these guys <laughs> is, again, simply e to the n it's that. Yes? I think you're missing an A in your second equation. It's A times lambda star. That's true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just checking whether you're attentive. <laughs> uh, so this is this. And then what you have here is the integral. And so I can write it like that. <coughs> I'm this. Uh, Maybe it's too small. I don't know. But too small? Is it too small? Too small? No. Bigger. <coughs> and then, where is it? Okay. Now, this is... Okay. So, you can, you can write... The expectation, so I'm just writing this with the f, which is, so what I take, 
I take the set, which is that the random vibe, the sum of the random viable needs to be bigger than n a. So that's an integration over that range. If I were to look at that specific random viable, and I, as a dummy integration viable, I use u for the for the s n. Except that I don't do it in the original. So if this factor were not there, this factor were not there, and this was the d p n. This was just like a symbolic representation of this probability here. Okay? But now I have twisted everybody, tilted everybody, and I'm using the tilted distribution and I have added the corresponding factor that I have there. And that's an exact relation. Okay? Are we. Right? Are you with me? Okay, and then once you have obtained this, there is something which is. So this is again valid for any lambda. But there is something that is happening here that now you can use. So in general, in general, you don't know how to evaluate that because, it, I mean, I've just shifted things around. But there is something that I can do, which is that if I know specialize in this expression, and then instead of taking any lambda, I take that guy, the lambda star, then I need, I know that the mean of the random variable here will be precisely at NA. Because the mean of this random variable here, so that's why you tilt distribution. The mean of this random variable was at N mu, right? Because it's the sum of independent random variable, each of which has a, a, a mean mu. But after tilting, because of the, the relation that are written there, I can actually shift the mean of the x's, denoted as x tilt, wherever I want. And so can I do it with the, the s. Okay? So if I do that, right, and here I use, I specialize this by taking lambda is equal to lambda star of a, probably too small, right, a little bit bigger. So if you specialize and you take lambda equal lambda star of a, then something, you know, miraculous, there's no miracle in that, but sort of interesting is happening. Namely, that now you're integrating this quantity, right? You're integrating this quantity from the mean up. Sorry, how do we call the integration variable? P, 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 P and so this, this is the distribution, right? So, so now I, we, we use these guys. If I put an n, it's for the sum of these quantity. If I put an n for this one, it's for the sum of the other. Okay? And so what's happening here is that if, if you go from n a up to infinity, you pick, if I put this lambda, I'm picking up the mean of this random variable. So intuitively, this here should pretty much take half of what, what is the probability? It should be of order one anyway, right? Because, right? Be because I'm integrating from, you know, I can recenter everything. Right? It could be, well, of order one, if I take that guy out. Okay, so, so what you can write, you know, a little bit, one more step, which is that you can subtract this, right? But if I subtract this, uh, it's a plus, so I need to put and a here, right? So that's the exponential that goes like that. And now this guy should essentially be of order one. Now, I'm not going to do the next step, but what you can show, what you can actually do is that you can take a, a lower bound here. You can bound this guy from below by truncating the expectation that n b with b bigger than a. Then you take logs. And then you take first n to infinity, and then b to a. And what you can actually prove is the following statement. And that's actually Kramer's theorem. So let me write it here, which is the kind of the, you know, the, the main theorem that I wanted to prove here. Namely that if you take the log of p of s n bigger or equal to n a, and then you multiply that by n, uh, minus 1, 
then so you so this guy has a limit so if you take the limit as n going to infinity of this quantity it gives you minus i of a This statement is what this guy actually meant. And it explains this, equality, this strange equality here. It says that it's, they are asymptotically equivalent, but in, in after taking a log. It's very rough asymptotics. Because if, I, if you were to add here any factor in the exponential that is of order n lower than 1, like square root of n, or if you were to multiply this by any power of n, after taking the limit and making this operation, taking the log and taking n minus 1, taking the limit, it will disappear. This statement is the only statement of a large diffusion theory, and it's, it's, a, it's a statement that was first made by a guy named Kramer. Not to be confused with the Kramer with a K that will come later, that worked in the 40s and 50s and, and, and worked on reaction related theory. This guy was an actuarian. And he is responsible for the first large deviation theorem, which is this theorem for some of random variable. Okay. I'll move on. Maybe just saying one thing that I, I said before, which is that this trick is actually kind of useful. And we'll go into that later <coughs> when I go into numerics. Namely that if you think about doing Monte Carlo, and you were to try to do a naive estimate of the Monte Carlo, you want to estimate this by naive Monte Carlo, brute force, this would be O plus if n is large and a is away from the mean. Why? Because typically you would need an exponentially large number of samples to get a, a sample size in your Monte Carlo which is statistically significant. Okay? If, on the other hand, you manage to calculate this deterministic problem here, which is the minimization that I have taken there, which gives you the optimal tilt that you need to put, you know, the, the lambda that allows you to tilt the random variable at the right place, then you cannot do Monte Carlo, it's not completely trivial, but you can do Monte Carlo in the new ensemble with the tilted random variable and simply put the right factors in the one that I've written there. And the variance of this estimator is likely to be much better. And we'll show that that's true indeed. Okay? Because now, essentially, you do the work where you need to do it. And you just unbias this bias estimator in the way that you know. Okay, so it's a, it's a completely it's an exact method like the standard Monte Carlo, but you have reduced bias, so it's important sample. Okay. Uh, let me see what I'm doing with, with time. Okay. Okay. So I We'll discuss later. You'll show me. You, you're going to make presentation later, so I'll find out a little bit what are your interests, etc. We'll decide later whether this was, you know, either too trivial or too technical or whatever, and 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 move on for the next classes. Just one second. What I want to do now, after this, is to try to generalize that because, in some sense, what I've done here, right, and give you examples. Okay. I'll first do an example where I don't even need to generalize any of this, but. Um, after that, I will, do, I will generalize that in cases where they, these random variables here are not necessarily independent, nor do they take value in R, really when you know, they, they are in more, much more abstract space. And that's uh, Ellis Garner term that I will give you in a minute. Okay? But before I do that, I want to make one, one, one little caveat. There was a question. Yeah, uh, just to be sure, I think we said it, that the definition of the that means the log of this and the log of that, the log on both sides, the ratio tends to 1 as n goes to infinity. Okay? That guy is called the speed of the large deviation principle. And in general, you don't know. It could be, for example, if the random variables are dependent in a certain way, that what you need to put here is not n, but something else. In that case, you'd have to find what is the factor here. So this has a limit. Okay. Before I do that, let me just show you one example, which is you know where you can do this thing quite easily, which is um, quickly. Let me erase this. Okay. <coughs> I'm going to take. Suppose I take a Bernoulli. Suppose I say that x 
is a random variable that can take by plus or minus, so it's not a standard Bernoulli, but the reason why I'm going to do that is because this x will become a spin signal in just a second. And it takes value plus or minus 1 with probability 1 half each. So it's, it's not a Bernoulli for two reasons. First is that Bernoulli typically is 0, 1. And typically, the probability here is p and q, or p and 1 minus p. So I take that specific, just that case. Okay. So if you do that, right, you know that if I, if I look at what is the, this guy, well, it's just the expectation. So what is the expectation? It's just 1 half of e to the lambda plus e to the minus lambda. Right? So cosh with a log. Yes? And if you do the, the inverse, you know, the, the, the Legendre transform, in a minute I'll show you that these guys are dual of one another, what you end up having here is, and here I need the, uh, my note because I don't remember, so that should be, is this. Is this quantity? Okay. So I mean, <clears throat> if you look at what this function <laughs> is, right, it's just something which is so it, it's it's uh, it's only defined for a in between minus one and one. In fact, you can take limit at minus one and one. Why is that? Is because uh, th this guy here is also between minus one and one, right? And remember that this is for weighted sum of. of of random variable of this type, right? If you put an i and they are all, right? So, so it's clear that the, this guy will be between minus one and one. And it's equal to, it, it has a shape which is like this, with infinite derivative at the edge and a finite, finite value. So this is a and i of a. Okay? That's the one that you can use if you want to, for example, compute what is the probability, I don't know, that, that, you, that you, you go at, a, you, you do a game with uh, tossing a coin, and you toss a thousand of them, and you'd like to have that 800 that head. That's far from, the, uh, from CLT, so this, this is what you need to use. Okay? It's also interesting because it gives you this. So there is a model that probably you guys already know and, you know, and moved on because it's, uh, it's three ways. It's the one where you take the following Hamiltonian. You take the Hamiltonian for n spins. Right? And the way you write it is you say you simply do the full sum over all of the n, sigma i times sigma j, you put the minus here, maybe one half. It could be a coupling constant, but let's forget about the coupling constant. And then you put minus h times the sum from i equal 1 of 2n of sigma i. That's a spin system with a uniform applied field. Right? And, and what you have is that uh, if, if, if you align with the spin, you lower the energy. If you align the spin, you lower the energy, right? And in this context, it's interesting to look at m, which is, there's an m missing here, the sum from i equal 1 up to n of sigma i. That's the average magnetization in the center, right? And here, you can take a dp, which is now a dp of sigma, right? It's a dpn, because this is the vector sigma, which is simply some normalization factor z minus 1, that depends on beta, and then you have the exponential of minus n, uh, no n, beta h sigma. That's it, let me put it with a little light, so that one, right? We can look at that guy. Okay? Right? So, the quantity that's there is the z beta which is simply the sum of all spin configuration of e to the minus beta h of sigma. Yes? This guy can, so this guy, for the, the reason, okay, so the reason why this model is easy is because it's, it's the spin in no dimension. Every, I mean, it's the fully connected graph. Every spin interacts with every other. Okay, that's the one that has a phase transition that's trivial to analyze. And how can you look at that? Well, you can look at that by trying to compute the z of beta. How can you calculate the z of beta? Well, one thing that you could, for example, do 
is that you could try to calculate what is uh, to calculate this sum here by using the fact that this sum can be done in the following way. You can do the sum over all, so you can do this. You can factorize the sum into a sum over m, this m, that go from minus 1 to plus 1 in step of 2 over n. And then the sum over all sigma, which are such that 1 over n, sum over i equal 1 up to n of sigma i, is equal to m of e to the minus beta h of sigma. Now, this is very easy to do for one simple reason, namely that this guy, the guy that's here, is simply minus n m squared over 2, if, if this is m, minus n h m. So, because this only depends on m, if I do a conditional probability here, I can simply take this factor, in fact, because of this conditioning, can be taken there, because it's of that form. And the only thing that I need to compute there, then, is this. This sum. Now, of course, you can compute this sum exactly, because you, that's what, this is how can I arrange n spins in such a way that their sum is equal to m. Right? So I need, you know, I need to do, I need to have <coughs> n minus m over 2 up and n plus m over, um, n, well, what, you, you know what I mean. You, you just need to have that the difference between the up and the, and the, and the, the down spin is just nm. Okay? So that's, that's a binomial that's very simple to do. But there's another way to think about this, which is that what you are calculating here is just a probability, right, of, of, of this, you know, this random variable, which is the sum here. That's the weighted sum. But, but then I know what it is, because this is what I've just computed here. So I know that this guy here, right, let me continue that way. I know with all having all of the, I mean, of course, in, this exa in the example here, doing the combinatorics is trivial, but, but in more general example, it's not so. You know that z of beta is equal to what? Is the sum from m equal minus 1 to plus 1, right? By little steps. So I need to, and then I have e to the minus beta, so let me write it. It's just, uh, beta n, m squared over 2, that's too small, sorry, m squared over 2 plus h m, which is the one that's coming from there. <coughs> and then I know, I know what this guy will do. It will just put this factor, is n times the i, well, of m. I mean, there I called it a, right? But, but the A here corresponds to the weighted sum of my Bernoulli there, which in the context I just changed notation because in the context of Curie Wise, you typically call that the magnetization M. So it's the I of M. Right? And that's and somehow I'm done because already this tells you right, that there will be a phase transition. Why will there be a phase transition? It's because this guy there, right, is a parabola up. Yes, it says that if you just think about the energy, the system wants to align itself with the, take h equals 0, for example, right? It's going to go plus 1 or minus 1. If h is not 0, there is one of them that's favorite, which is the one where h is aligned with that. But this guy accounts for the fact that among all of these configurations, right, the one where they are all aligned, well, there's only one, and there is much more configuration that are misaligned, right? And so... If you take, if you take, if at, at the, when you vary beta, you can have that, if you look at this potential here, this free energy, right, if you think about that as being n times the free energy of m, that depends on beta. Probably I should write it like that, so that, you know, this, this is the, what's in the exponential. Where this guy has a minimum varies. At very low temperature, which is at very high beta, 
is always aligned on one side or the other. But if you go to a higher temperature, then this one starts to win because you decrease beta and this term wants to misalign. Okay? In some sense, it's just a consequence of what was done here. Of course, you, you could have done it in a different way, which is you could have computed that with the binomial. And then you could have done, for the binomial, you could have used Stirling formula. And that would have given you the same result. But, but Stirling formula, you can think about it as an approximation of an integral, which is a large deviation principle. OK? That's that. OK. Now, any? Yeah, actually, could you just um, explain again uh, why, when you take the sum over the ve um, sigma, you get a, a factor of minus <coughs> e to the minus n i? I was writing it in this side. This guy? Yeah. Sorry, is that, is that where the, the minus n i comes from, or is that comes from somewhere else? That's what this guy is, yes. Right, so we, yeah, so I just, can you just explain again why, when you take that sum, you get that factor? Because what, what we have, I mean, what we have obtained before essentially is to say that if you, I'll, I'll get to that, I'll give you a better explanation in a minute, I think, but what we have essentially says is that this quantity here, right, tells you what is the probability of the weighted sum of this random variable, right? The probability that this weighted sum be above a certain value is e to minus n i a, right. if okay. the value is a, right? But that's exactly... What, what what this is calculating? Oh right, okay, right. Yeah, it's just up to right. There's no normalization, right? Up to up to up to constants. Right. That's exactly what this is doing. Okay, okay. So now first let's, let's discuss this in two different, slightly different ways now, which is that let me give you you know some generalization of this. First of all, it's there is a term from Garner Ellis that that we will use quite often that says. The, the framework that you see is much more general than, than what we had defined before. And it says, namely, suppose that you have any SN. It's a sequence of random variables. Okay? And they can take value in any reasonable space. So it doesn't need to be taking value in R. It could take value in RD or in a, some function space. Value of sequence, whatever. Suppose that I introduce on whatever. So this guy take values in, you know, in a certain this is a sample space that I'm considering. Right? And suppose that um, I introduce on that space an inner product. And I calculate the following thing. You take, so same thing as what we were writing before. Yeah. It is as and still as partial sum of I I divided. No, it's a sequence. It's a sequence. So you take this guy. Uh, you take, suppose I can define that quantity. So here, this is an inner product. We were in R, so it was just a product. In RD, it would be the standard inner product in RD. But, but it is a function where it could, it's the inner product that you would define on your function. So I can define an inner product between these two quantities. right? And then, suppose I take the exponential of this. And then I take the expectation of that. And then I take the log. OK. And then I divide by n. <laughs> That's exactly what we were doing before. Mm -hmm. right? If this guy has a limit as n goes to infinity, call it, in general, if this, if this guy leave a function space, this could also live in a function space. If it's in RD, that was also RD, et cetera. But I can define an I of lambda. Imagine that this guy exists, OK? And that you can define it in some domain. So for D, that's in some domain D, right? And that over there is differentiable. It's differentiable in D, OK? And if D is not the full space, which is such that if you look at this gradient, it's essentially infinity at the boundary, so these three conditions. If that's true, then this random variable satisfies a large deviation principle with speed n with respect to 
the range function that you obtain by taking the Legendre transform of this. So if you take, using the same notation as before, if you take the soup over all lambda of lambda times A, now these guys, again, same inner product, and you subtract this quantity, This random variable satisfy a large deviation principle with this rate function, exactly in the same sense of what I said before. Now, that's a little bit more complicated. So that's this statement, and we're gonna, I'm going to try to, is Gartner and his theorem. The precise condition I'm, you know, I'm, being, I'm going a little bit fast about, but, but they're essentially the one that I've written there, right, is the existence of the limit and some property of the limiting function that you get. It says that this is a good rate function. And the way, let me explain to you what that means. Okay, It means the following. Uh, which is, <clears throat> that's Vardan's lemma. It says, <coughs> here, Right, so what does that mean? So this is, this is a large deviation rate function. And Valen's lemma give you what it means. So the fact that it's a rate function means essentially that you can estimate probabilities by looking at this object and looking at its value over sets. That's what, if you want to know what's the probability of the random variable being in a set, this is what you know, this guy here is telling you. Right? And violent lemma is actually telling you the following thing. It says that, <clears throat> so if you take the following uh, object, which is so you take that guy, right? And then you take <coughs> So, it says simply, <coughs> so Vana's lemma says that if you, okay, so there's a limit again. It says that if you want to compute an expectation of this random variable that have a large division principle with this speed, you can actually use this guy to do it by computing a supremum. Okay? And, and we'll, we'll do that, I mean, if I have time, which I'm not sure I will have, I'll give you, uh, probably, I have until noon, right? Yeah. So then I, I, I can try. Okay, so <coughs> let, me, let me try to explain this a little bit by doing the violent lemma is also sometimes called Laplace theorem and it's based on Laplace method. So there is a small n, I think, exponential of small, small n. Uh, <clears throat> okay, let me, let, me, I, I, let, me, let me get to that in a second. So imagine that I do the following thing. There, there is a small n, you're right, uh, which is the same. Well, it depends. How you define the second. It depends how you define it, right. So, so let, me, let me explain that, because probably I should actually do it like, you know, like this. So it's just in front of F. I know, I know, but, but it's depend on, let, let, me, let me specialize that by doing this, which is the dual. So it's, it's easier to think about this in the following way. But then you have, then you have a, the, the N is implicit because there was no N here, so I don't need the N there. I mean, this is like, a, okay. Okay, so, no, I mean, this guy is the dual of that one as you can see, right? And they are doing one another by, by Legendre transform because uh, this is convex, right? These guys, in fact, guarantees that this is, I mean, this one we show is convex. This one is convex because it's defined by the, the, the and, and so if I take the, the Legendre transform of this one, I go back there. Okay, that's what written there. All right. Why is this, you know, Laplace? Term. It's because, uh, so I'm going to write this in a way which is a little bit, suppose, suppose I were to try to do the following thing. So 
you know, I have this random, I'm going to write an integral here, as if, as if I could integrate, as if this was, you know, an Euclidean space, okay? Suppose that I wanted to calculate a, a quantity, so imagine, let's go back to the case that we were looking at before, where the Sn is the sum from i equal 1 up to n of xi. Okay? And suppose I want to calculate, so suppose I would like to calculate in this something which would be of this scaling. This is the one that, uh, let me use u here to not confuse with the x. So imagine <coughs> that my ra the random variable that I have, imagine that the random variable that I have, I can think about this probability density, as you wish, as being what the large deviation principle tells me, which is e to the minus ni of u. Right? Probably to avoid confusion, I should use an a, which is the same letter as I'm using over there. Suppose I were to do that. If n is large, this integral, assuming that it exists, will be dominated by the point where the integral is maximum. That's the Laplace method, right? And that point is what? Well, that point is the one that satisfies the soup that's there if you replace Fa by lambda times A, OK? In fact, that tells you here that you could, in principle, calculate more than that because so Laplace method tells you that if you take the log of this, right? And again, you divide by 1 over n. Well, this will essentially go to the, I mean, let's, I'm not sure I need to write it one more time, but it's the soup over i of fa minus ia, simply that object, right? You, just a second. <clears throat> Clearly, you could do better than computing the log by doing Laplace method, including calculation of prefactor, which is that you take a Gaussian approximation, if, if it's possible, of these guys near the, near the supremum, assuming that the soup is being attained. And what you would get is a better estimate than this, you know, better that, that beats the log. But you would know what the prefactor is. We'll discuss that later. OK? Yes, there was a question somewhere. Could you write bigger? Ah, OK, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> like that. And this is just f of a minus i of a. Okay. Now, there is another, so this is Garner, Ellis, and I'm just introducing these things today, but we will use them in the next classes. The Bannon lemma, which says that it gives a meaning to that. Most of the time, we will try to calculate these objects here, right? But then there is one more thing that is important, which is that it's what's called the contraction principle. And if I have time, I'm going to make one more calculation involving this guy. The contraction principle says what? It says that suppose that I have established that this random variable here satisfies some large deviation principle with respect to A. And now suppose that I introduce a function over this random variable. So suppose that you know, I introduce an another one, which is a Tn that is being defined as being an f of Sn. But I, I map random variable from one to the other. Then I can get a large deviation principle for this one. Let's write it i hat of b simply by doing this. You take the inf over all a, which are such that f of a is equal to b of the i a. So you can compute, if you compute, a, if you compute a large deviation principle in a bigger space, if you wish, you can contract it into a lower space just by doing this infimum. It says that there's a transferability like if, if you manage to get a large deviation principle at a very high level, you can always transfer it down and to get something which is uh, of that type. Okay? If I have, do I have a, I have 12 minutes. So I'm going to do one little calculation with that, which is I'm going to calculate another large deviation principle. <clears throat> so I'm going to illustrate this now with, with one calculation that I, I hope will, you will find uh, instructive. Okay, suppose 
Suppose that I take xi, that are discrete random variables, and they have the property, they're going to be iid as usual. So I'm going back to the previous thing. And I'm going to introduce the fact that I want this quantity to be given by a pk. So it's a discrete set of random variables, say for k in m. Could be in z, could be a finite set. So this is a probability distribution of these quantities. OK? So <clears throat> we, let's assume we could assume that this guy has a finite mean. All moments exist, for example, by restricting what the pk is. And so I, I, could, I could calculate the large deviation principle here of sums of these random variables, xi, by what I did before. OK? Now, let's do something which is slightly different. And let's introduce this quantity. It's a bit of a mournful, again, of notation. But like, the tilde is not the same as the, maybe I don't need the tilde with, if I have the n. Let's let it be like that. That's enough. So what is this? It's, that's going to be the empirical estimate that I have of this probability if I draw n independent random variable xi. OK? So what is that? That's 1 over n. OK? And then it's the sum for i equal 1 up to n of the Kronecker delta k xi. Make sense? OK. <clears throat> now, if I want to illustrate quickly the, 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 the contraction principle, what I could try to do is I could try to clearly, if I get the large deviation principle for this quantity, I should be able to get back to the large deviation principle that I had for the empirical mean of the random variable, not of their distribution, because one, the information of one is contained in the other. So let's try to see whether I can find here what is the large deviation principle for this quantity. OK? So I'm going to use Garner Ellis. Right? So first of all, I need to calculate what is this quantity. Right? So I need an inner product on this space. And so the inner product that I'm going to do is that when I'm going to, it's a lambda p, which simply will be the sum from k while k in n, or whatever the, sum, the, the set is of this. That's the inner product that I'm going to get. Right? And so what is the quantity that I would like? What is this guy here? Right? Well, that's going to be the log of the expectation of what? Well, of this. Of this. Scale and multiply by that. Right? It's going to be e to the lambda is this quantity that I'd like to have. This is a random variable, right? This is a distribution, but this is a random variable. So I need to calculate that quantity there. But that quantity is actually kind of, of simple because in the sum, so what, what do we get here? Right? Let's rewrite it explicitly. This is the log of the expectation. So I suppose that like that. Of what? Well, this is the, you know, this is the, where, where are we at? This is, uh, it's this guy, right? So it's lambda xi. Yes, it picks the xi. But, but then this expectation is actually easy to write down. This is just the log of the sum over k in n of e to the lambda k pk. Well, that pk is that pk. Yes? Are we, you know with me? But then if I have done that, then I, I should, I, I, let's try to, what is the, what is no the, what is the i of a? I write it with a q, because the qp for me is not it. So what is that? That should be the soup over lambda, right, <coughs> of, well, lambda times q, so sum over q, lambda q, 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 minus the log of the sum over k. Let me not, you know, for simplicity of this.
yeah, that's that's the scalar product lambda times q. This is my i of lambda, right? Okay, <clears throat> you can you can do this little calculation, right? You need to okay. So if you do the calculation here, let me. I'm running a little bit out of time. What you're going to get is this. Uh, sorry. This is the relative entropy of Q with respect to P. Right? It's the KL divergence, I don't know, right? Of This result is actually not very surprising, but, but it tells you something which is kind of interesting, right? It says that, it says that if I compute this, suppo suppose I, I draw random variables and I would like to calculate the probability that they take certain value. I would like you know, to, to calculate this. What is the quality of this estimator if I have many, many samples, right? I know by the law of large number that this guy will converge towards this, right? As n goes to infinity, this converges to that. I can estimate the fluctuation around this by doing a CLT. But I can also ask myself, what's the probability that something will go really wrong? What is the probability that even though I have a big sample size, the p that I will be here will be close to a Q, which is not that guy. Well, that's the, this probability can be estimated as being e to the minus m dkl qp. That's, that's the probability. I'm going to write it roughly. But that's the probability that p and k, right? B is, I guess, write it with little wiggle like that, B equal to Q. Okay, so in, its, in terms of it's the whole probability. Okay, and of course, you need to give it a meaning with Vardan's lemma. Right? So, okay. This is a variant, I mean, it's a baby version of something that we're going to look at later on, which is just, this is just Sanoff theorem that I have derived here. And as a consequence of Garner Ellis. Okay? And Garner Ellis here apply because you have all the differentiability that you need to have for this quantity. Right? Yes? No. Yeah? To read this in this sense, uh, it's, I mean, you need the variables to be uh, identically distributed, but not necessarily independent for uh, in the, in the, in the, in the No, here, here I have assumed, so I have assumed that these guys are I, I, yeah. I yeah. Right? But it is, it is valid also in cases where, OK, they are, in, they are identically distributed, but not independent. independent. No. Okay. I mean, it, it can be, but you need to have a decay of correlation. Yeah. yeah. Because imagine that if you take the trivial case where they're all the same, then it's clearly wrong. Right? Mm -hmm. if, I take, if I take the big one, and then I just reproduce it n times, mm -hmm. but, but then there is no information in this sum except the one that I had in the first guy. Right? So in order for this to be valid, if they are correlated, you would need to, you would need to compute this quantity. You need to apply Gardner-Ellis. But here, Gardner-Ellis is very simple, the way I've done it, because they have used the independence. You notice I didn't take any limit here, right? Because I knew what I needed to have, right? OK? In fact, I should have written it probably with the, I should have write, I mean, I should have written that like that. And then, you know, a, 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 a limit. As, okay, let me write that. It was like this. This would be, I, mean, I, I took a shortcut here. Right? But what we actually calculated was that. Right? But because they're independent, I could again take, get, get rid of this n. I know what the limit is. If they are not independent, then you need to do that more carefully. Yes. yes. Okay. So, so, right, that's a good point. I mean, I went a bit fast. So there's that. And now, but then, you know, one more thing, and then I'm, I'm done because otherwise I'm going to be out of time. In principle, now I could use the, uh, my contraction, you know, the contraction principle. 
which is, I should be able to calculate that, which is, okay, let's write it, this was the original i. Maybe I should put a little, okay, so let's put the at on this one, because that's the one that we have calculated at the beginning of the class. This guy should be what? It should be the inf over, where am I? Over all q's, which are such that the sum for k over k of k q k equal a. That's the empirical mean, right? Of this guy. That should give you back the one that we had before. Yes? So you can try to do this calculation. It's an explicit SKI. You can do this calculation it's actually quite explicit. Because you can you can you can add this as a Lagrange multiplier. So what you can try to do is you can try to do the following thing. I say I think inf of the DKL, which is what? Which is the sum over K of the log of QK over PK uh, plus lambda. I'm going to put the Lagrange multiplier lambda. Why is this lambda? It's to impose this constraint. You're going to put this guy, some KQK. That's the Lagrange multiplier that's for the constraint that's there, right? So you can do this infimization. Okay? Again, it's, a, it's an infimization over what? It's, no, it's an infusion over all Q. Because I get rid of the constraint because I put it with the Lagrange multiplier. But then I need to get at the end, I need to remember what the Lagrange multiplier will be. You know, to, if you do that, you will, you know, what you, the solution of this problem will be exactly this. It's not the same lambda as the lambda k that's there. It's a Lagrange, okay, so there's no, don't be confused. It's this. If you do this minimization problem, right, and you look what the minimi if you, and you look at what is the minimizer of this, and then you evaluate that quantity of the minimizer, it's this. Right? Yes? And if you want to find what is the Lagrange multiplier, that's the operation that you need to do. So you will go exactly back to what you had before. I'm, I'm skipping a few steps here, but, but you can do them because it's just elementary algebra. I'm telling you, do this, infin do this minimization problem. One way to do it is with Lagrange multiplier, and then find out what is the Lagrange multiplier that you will need to, find, to put in. So this minimization problem is trivial, right? And why is it trivial? Simply because that one you can you can do. I uh, forgot the Q, right? Okay. That one you can do simply by taking derivatives, etc. And then you can you know put the minimizer back into the objective function and find out what is the lambda. That's the solution. And that's that's what we had done at the beginning of the class. Okay. So Sanov's theorem, that's a consequence of Gardner Ellis, gives you back the large deviation principle for the empirical mean of a random variable. And that's an example of a contraction principle where you're looking at the empirical mean of a distribution, which is level two, large deviation, and then you go back to level one, which was the one of Kramer. Okay? And we'll use that quite a lot in, in, in what comes later, this type of construction. Particular, one, one ex example where you can do that, which will be useful when, when you look at Markov processes. Or, or which are either you know, discrete time mark of jump processes or, or diffusion, is that you can write down a large deviation principle of the space of path. And you can use that as a contraction principle to actually calculate the probability that at time t the process is somewhere. Because you're contracting over all the paths that end up where you want them to be. And it's easier to write down the large deviation principle in path space than it is for the endpoints. Okay, we'll discuss that later. Okay, I, I think I'm done, right?
precise uh, problem and this is again now. How do you go from the probability that the, the sum the random variable is uh, bigger than something to equal to something? Okay, so <coughs> In, in, in at the level of large deviation, that doesn't make any difference. That's the short answer. Because, 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 because the essence of large deviation is this picture, in a way. Let's, you know, <coughs> these are the level set of the i of a. This is i of a is equal to constant. Right? And if you want to calculate what is the probability that an event occurs, for example, that the variable be in this set, right? You need to integrate over that set. In the case of the linear variable, that set is just a line. You need to integrate for everything that's at the right. But what large deviation tells you is, and that's the essence of Laplace method, it says, I really don't need to do any of this integral. I need to, if I want to do a prefactor, but the only thing that I need to find out is this, assuming that the level set goes this way. That point gives me everything. And that's, that's the optimum. So that's, I mean, that's, that's, why, that's why you go from bigger equal to into, right? If you, the, the actual answer, which is a more technical one, is that, of course, you need, you need to, I mean, you need to then look into Garner. I told you Garner Ellis gives you a right function, but I didn't really explain what the right function is, except by Varadhan's lemma. But Varadhan's lemma is that. That's the picture version of Varadhan's lemma, right? Because if you take Varadhan's lemma is with a function, it's expectation of function, but it's, instead of taking expectation of function, you take the characteristic function of a set, the indicator function of a set, that's what it gives. It's the same thing. But in the case where you're trying to compute how many terms are in the sum, or yeah. uh, the, the sum is equal to the magnetization times n, yes. uh, you can do it by combinatrix, and you would use Sterling to approximate that, and here you are also doing an approximation. You, you are, right? You are doing an approximation, which is that you're neglecting i all the terms, yes. right? It's always log asymptotix. So you're not computing z of beta, if you wish. You're computing the log of z of beta, 1 over n, limit as n goes to infinity, okay? Which is the, f the scale free energy. That's the one you want, and you need to get the, the I need to tell you the information. I, you don't understand what is the true connection between the Gartner and theorem and the Vardan's lemma. Is the Vardan's lemma a generalization or? No, the, the, I use Vardan's Vardan lemma is just a way to free, it says, so Gartner Ellis tells you, under this condition, I have a good rate function, okay? A Varadhan's lemma tells you, if I have a good rate function, this is what I can do with it to compute integral, right? I use that as a shortcut to use rate function without having to completely define them. Because if you want to define really what is a good rate function with large deviation, we can do that at next class or we can do that offline if you want. It's a little bit annoying because it comes with a, you know, a, a lower bound and an, and, and, a, and an upper bound that are taken with, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's not very transparent. So I try to avoid that, but I tell you, this is, you know, it gives you this rate function, that's what you can do with it. They are not connected. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you know some good reference for this so we can follow the, what you presented today? Yes. So should I send that by email or tell you? Uh, maybe, yeah, you can send it to me and then we'll put it in a Dropbox, but then it's available to everybody. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, I can. They, they, you know, it, it, um, there are several references. Typically, they tend to be quite technical. They start with uh, let x be a Polish space, and then you know. But but that's why. But but I'll I'll send you references. Um, There are no other questions. It's lunch time, and we meet here again at one fifteen for the people that are staying.